verse 2, Psalm 23, verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Uh, would you pray with me, Lord? This is your word. Would you let us understand what you would have us understand? Speak to us through your word this morning that we might be drawn closer to you and closer together. Lord, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You can be seated. Um, so I'm reading uh, this recently written, published book by this guy named David Paul Hewson. Now, most of you probably don't know who that is. Um, he goes more by his stage name of Bono. It's the lead singer for the band U2. And anyway, his book is fascinating. It's called Surrender, 40 Songs, One Story, and it's an autobiography of sorts, and where each chapter is based off a U2 song throughout the last 40 or so years, almost 50 years. Um, chapter 11 is called I Will Follow, which was, a, which was released on their first album in 1980 on their, their album titled Boy, and um, Bono wrote that song about his mother who had passed away when he was 14. This is how the chapter begins, chapter 7, I Will Follow. It's the words of Bono. The elephant in the room is a phrase I enjoy, having at different times been either elephant or room. We can lose ourselves in situations or conversations and miss the obvious. We're looking for someone to save us or a solution to a problem, and they're right in front of us, hiding in plain sight. He goes on to say that hanging in our house is a wall-sized art, piece of art by filmmaker Wim Wenders. The road to Emmaus is a recent photograph of that road just outside of Jerusalem where close friends of Jesus are said to have walked with him without knowing it. A couple of days after his crucifixion, there's a rumor he's alive and no one can find the body. His friends are confused, grief-stricken, terrified, oblivious to the identity of this stranger until the moment he says goodbye. Now they wake up to the possibility that the very heart of their faith has been beating loudly at their side, if only they'd had eyes to see. Sometimes things are difficult to see for what they truly are, especially when they're right in front of us. Sometimes what we need are, are fresh eyes, if you will, or maybe a new perspective. We're looking at a very familiar verse in a very familiar psalm, Psalm 23 this morning. Verse 2 is almost as recognizable as verse 1. The words, he makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, roll off of the tongue right behind the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, almost without even knowing what to do. Like we, we almost can't stop with the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, without that next part. But, but the familiarity might actually prevent us from seeing this verse as we should. This morning, my hope is that we will look at this verse with fresh eyes, with a, maybe a new perspective. Let's talk the vision that probably comes to mind when we read this verse. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. It's likely a vision of sheep who are eating and drinking. The shepherd, the good shepherd, so it seems, has taken his sheep to a lush meadow, a place where sheep graze and, and on the finest blades of grass. The shepherd, the good shepherd, so it seems, has also taken his sheep to the still water. Some translations say quiet water is a place where the sheep may drink of the purest of water. And that would be a thing, a good thing for a good shepherd to do, right? To take his sheep to a spot where this grass is perfect to eat, where the water is perfect to drink. In our minds, we can almost see the shepherd leading his sheep to enjoy and get their feel of the best of the best, the greenest pasture, the stillest water. That would be and has been a well-received explanation of this text. Follow the shepherd and he'll lead you to the best food. Give up and follow the shepherd and you will find the finest water. But the elephant in the room, as Bono put it, is that that's not the vision we should get from this verse. The good shepherd has not led his sheep to the green pastures to eat. And he has not led his sheep to the still waters to drink. Let's read it again with fresh eyes. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The sheep in this, in this um, Psalm 23 is not eating in the green pasture. The sheep is lying down. The sheep here is not drinking the still water. The word, the term beside here actually is another way of saying he's lying down. It's that he's reclining on the bank of this still water. The imagery here is not of a sheep eating and drinking. The imagery is of a sheep lying down and resting. Now let's ask a question. Why would the sheep lie down? Why would the sheep rest here of all places? So here's the deal. Healthy sheep sleep about four to five hours a day. That's it, four to five hours a day. They lie down at other times, but about four or five hours of the day they're sleeping. Here's the kicker, though. Healthy sheep only lie down when three criteria have been met. They only rest, whether it's to sleep or just to rest, to lie down, when three distinct criteria have been met. This is really important for us because this is what, this is what we're going to see here, at least the second two. So here's what, what are those three criteria? The first one is that the sheep must have security. Or to say it another way, the sheep must feel safe. We're not going to spend too much time here. We're going to see this actually in a couple of weeks. But just this is what we need to know. The shepherd provides security for the sheep. And unless the sheep knows that, the sheep will not lie down. If the sheep gets spooked or the shepherd gets scared or anything like that, the sheep will not lie down. They will refuse to lie down. They'll be on alert. They'll be terrified. They'll be thinking they need to move quickly. So, so first, and the one we're going to spend pretty much, that's it, amount of time on, on is that for sheep to lie down, the sheep had to feel security. They had to feel safe. Number two, after safety, for a sheep to lie down, the sheep had to be full. The sheep could not be hungry. Hungry sheep do not lie down because hungry sheep are too busy looking food. They're looking grass to eat. They're, they're interested in grazing. They, they, they want to fill their stomachs. They eat and they eat and they eat until they're full. And until they're full, they will not lie down. So they had to have security. They had to be full. And then finally, the third part that had to be true for sheep to lie down, they cannot be thirsty. They had to have water. They had to have enough water to meet their needs. Thirsty sheep will not lie down. They will look for water. If there's no water around, they'll actually, they'll actually eat more, overeat, hoping that the grass that they eat has enough moisture in it so that they can, be, they, that, that they can um, be hydrated through the grass that they're eating. So actually, thirsty sheep will just eat more. So the shepherd, get this, his task in this Psalm 23, matter of fact, any shepherd, his task, if he wants his sheep to rest, he has to make sure they're safe. He has to make sure they've eaten and they're not hungry. And he has to make sure they've had adequate water and are not thirsty. Three criteria or healthy sheep are not lying down. Now, now, here's what we see in Psalm 23. And, and we've said this, but I mean, this is key. The sheep in the green pastures, he's lying down. The sheep beside, beside the still waters, the quiet waters, he's lying down. This sheep is resting. So here's what we know to be true about the sheep in Psalm 23. Based off what we just walked through, the sheep in Psalm 23 is safe. The sheep in Psalm 23 is full. And the sheep in Psalm 23 is hydrated. There's no danger. There's no hunger. There's no thirst. Building upon what we saw last week, guess what? This just flows perfect. That sheep lacks nothing. Now, we could stop there and be like, there's your point. That sheep lacks nothing. He's got everything he needs, safety, food, and water, or he's been filled and he's not thirsty. But if we want to know what's really happening here, we need to ask why. We need to ask a series of why questions. Maybe we get the security part. Okay, the shepherd's there. He's protecting the sheep. He set up a border. He knows where he's at. They, they feel secure, and, and he would have had a way of speaking to them that they would have known that they were secure. We can get that part, maybe. We're going to pick up on that in a few weeks. But why? Why would a shepherd lead his sheep 
to this green pasture with the very best of the best of grass to eat if the sheep were full? And why would a shepherd lead his sheep to the quiet, still waters, the best of the best of the natural spring water to drink, if the sheep were not thirsty? And then maybe the biggest why is why is that significant? Let's, let's talk about green pastures for a minute. Green pastures in this place were not that easy to find in this time. The shepherd would have had to work really hard to locate the perfect green pasture to lead his sheep to. Um, this is prime eating. This is the good stuff. Other times, the sheep would have eaten weeds that they found in between rocks on the road or on the bank of the path. They would have eaten anything they could have eaten. I mean, any kind of grass they could have eaten. But here, they are literally in the middle of just surrounded by a delicacy. Like, this is the best food they could eat. Think of for a moment, if you will, your favorite restaurant. Or maybe the best meal you've ever had at a really nice restaurant, somewhere that you may not even get the chance to go to very often. Think about going to this restaurant and watching <clears throat> as the wait staff brings plate after plate of the finest food that you've ever seen, food you love, food that makes your mouth water right on by you to other tables, and you have no desire to eat. You have the best food surrounding you. You have your favorite food right around you. You have the best of the best food around you, yet, yet you're not interested. You do not touch it. You do not taste it. Why not? Because you are already full. That's what's going on with these sheep here. That's why they're lying down. They don't need this grass because they're already full. But why are they full? Well, maybe they ate on the way. Maybe they snacked too much. Maybe they stopped off for some weeds, like I said, between the rocks on the, 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 the road, the path. This, this is how my brain works. I, I don't know if yours works this way. I doubt we're much different. But when I know that I'm going to eat a really good meal, maybe Mary's making something that I really love, or maybe I have something on the smoker all day, or, or maybe we're going to just go out and get a really good meal, I usually don't snack that day at all. I may not even eat lunch. Just the anticipation of that really good meal makes me want to wait and makes me want to get there with an empty stomach, makes me want to make sure that I have plenty of room, which I often have plenty of room there. But I remember your father. I don't know if you've ever told your kids this. You know, hey, hey don't eat too much. Don't spoil your dinner. Save some room. Think about it. If this is... A good shepherd, and we know that it is. Do you think that he, taking these sheep to this lush meadow with this perfect grass, do you think he's letting them eat along the way? Do you think he's, he, he's saying, hey, hey, get you a mouthful of those weeds in between those rocks? You think he's saying, hey, hey, go ahead and fill up on that okay grass. Don't worry about it. We're headed to the green pastures, but don't worry about it. You don't want to be hungry when we get there. You think a good parent who's taking their kid to their favorite place to eat where they're going to have good food says, hey, I tell you what, before we go in, you better get a mouthful of Skittles. Like, probably not. You don't, you, our parents don't say, hey, we're about to have you, the meal you love. You better fill up before we go in there. No. It doesn't make sense if we're going to a really nice steakhouse to pull into the McDonald's across the street before we go in. Like, right? No, this, these sheep haven't been snacking. The sheep hasn't filled up along the way. So that means, and, and get this, we, we, we need to get this. But this is the visual that we need here. This sheep lying in the middle of this green pasture. The good, sheep would not, the good shepherd would not have allowed that sheep to eat junk along the way. Which means the sheep must have been filled up with something better than the grass that they're lying in. I'm going to repeat that. The sheep must have been filled with something better than the grass that they're lying in. What would be better than these green pastures? If you have your Bible, John chapter 6 is where we're going to read from. I'm not going to read all of this. I'm going to give us a summary. And I'm going to apologize to those of you who are fans of The Chosen because this is a spoiler alert for the next couple of episodes. All right, so just so you know. So in John chapter 6, 
Jesus is ministering to this large crowd. It's time to eat. They certainly cannot feed this many people. But, and you know the story, which is, which by the way, this story is the lone miracle that's in all four of the Gospels, I believe. The only one that shows up in all four of the Gospels. There's this kid there that has five little loaves of bread and a couple of fish. And here's the spoiler, just so you know. So if you're about to watch this in a couple of weeks on the big screen. But this is the spoiler. Jesus multiplies the loaves and the fish, and he feeds 5,000 men there with just a little bit of food. Now, fast forward a few verses, and Jesus has headed back to Capernaum. And the crowds who, who have been at that feeding, they follow him to Capernaum. And when they find him, they question him. And this is what we find Jesus saying. Okay, this is John 6. We're going to pick up in verse 26. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Now, let's just stop there just for a minute so I can explain what's going on. They're looking Jesus. They've tracked Jesus down to Capernaum because he filled their stomachs with some loaves and some fish. What they want from Jesus is another meal, is some more food. But Jesus has something better for them. All right, he has something better. Look at verse 27. Jesus says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to, to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. And then they answered to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it was written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And then Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Truly, now I fast forward to verse 47, but truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, here's our answer. Why is this sheep able to go to this beautiful green pasture and not be hungry? Not want to partake of the delicacy that was surrounding this sheep. It's because this sheep has partaken of something better. This sheep has been filled by something better. This sheep has been filled by the bread of life. The bread of life, as we just read, that leads to eternal life. That leads to, as we talked about a few weeks ago, abundant life. This sheep does not need to eat of the green pasture because this sheep's been nourished by the bread of life, by the good shepherd. Now, we're going we're gonna to move quickly for time's sake, but to help us understand that, the story is reinforced when we find out that this sheep also is lying down next to the quiet waters. So, so this, is, this is probably even, I love this one even more than the bread of life one. So, so here's the story in John chapter 4. If you're already in John, just turn a couple pages, you'll be in John chapter 4. Jesus is at this well in Samaria, and he meets this woman. And the woman has come to him, come to this well at an odd time because she's living such a sinful lifestyle that, that she's been rejected by, even, by, by all of her society in, in Samaria there. So let's read it. John chapter 4, begin with verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, <clears throat> a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, 
And who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come and draw water, here to draw water. Living water. Whoever, it says here in this passage, drinks of the living water will never be thirsty. Living water, a spring of water, it says, welling up to eternal life, to abundant life. Why is the sheep in Psalm 23 not thirsty? Why is the sheep in Psalm 23 not drinking this pure, unadulterated spring water? Because that sheep's already been hydrated. That sheep's already been hydrated by the living water, by something greater. That sheep has drank from the living water. The sheep in Psalm 23 can lie down in the middle of the most delicious grass. The sheep in Psalm 23 can lie down beside the most pure and healthy water. Why? Because the sheep in Psalm 23 gets its nourishment from the good shepherd. Because the sheep in Psalm 23 has partaken of the bread of life, of the living water. Now, now we hear this and we're like, what are you talking about? What does this mean? Eating the bread of life? Drinking the living water? Never being hungry again? Never being thirsty again? You already know this, but let me just say this in case there's a little bit of confusion. This isn't about food and water. The point here in verse 2 is not about eating the grass or drinking the water. This isn't about eating and drinking. This verse is about where we get our life from. This verse is about the real source for our identity, for our nourishment, for our very being. This is where is the real source for abundant life. Where does the sheep go to be filled? The green pasture? No. The steel water? No. The bread of life. The living water. Jesus is the source of nourishment. Jesus is the source of life. Jesus must be the source of our everything. Remember what we said last week? I lack nothing. It says, in part, when we have Jesus, we lack nothing. We have everything. But, but can I ask us a question here? If Jesus is our only source for life, why do we go to so many other places looking life? If Jesus is our only source for being, why do we go to so many other places looking being? If Jesus is our only source for for eternal, abundant kingdom life, then why are we going to so many other places looking satisfaction? Why are we feeding in places that are not the bread of life? Why are we drinking from places that are not filled with the living water? Where have we been seeking nourishment and meaning and abundance from other than Jesus if he's our only source for the bread of life and living water. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, we, we read this. For my people have two, committed two evils. Some of you know this. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they've hewed or dug, dug out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. If Jesus is our source of living water, if Jesus is our source of the bread of life, why then are we drinking out of broken cisterns? Places that we think will define us that don't. Places that we go to feed 
that leave us hungry. Places that we go for nourishment and hydration, but leave us thirsty. And again, I'm not talking food here. Places to fill us that never fill us. Do you ever wonder sometimes why you walk around unsatisfied? I do. I wonder that sometimes. Why is it that I'm not satisfied sometimes? Because I'm drinking from a broken cistern. Because I'm partaking of bread that's not the bread of life. And you know what it does? It leaves me hungry over and over. I drink from the broken cistern and I'm left thirsty over and over again. I'm confessing to you, sometimes I get my nourishment, my identity, who I am, my very being from the wrong places. And I'm left lacking, which is the opposite of what we talked about last week. When I've been temporarily filled by the wrong bread and I've been temporarily filled by the wrong water, it is temporary because I run out. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. And guess what else I am? I'm in need of rest, which is what the sheep are doing in verse 2. They're not eating and drinking. They're resting. When I try to return again and again to the cistern of popularity or the cistern of money or the cistern of possessions or the cistern of work or the cisterns of whatever else you want to put in there, I'm left wanting, I'm left lacking, I'm left hungry and thirsty. I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you a, an example. This is not in my notes. I'm not charging y'all for this one at all. It's a free one. I was having a conversation this week with, with somebody, or the first part of the week, like Tuesday of this week, and it was just a, just a normal conversation that I would have every week, pretty much. But in that conversation... Just one little, one little thing was said that, that was a comment that had been made. I don't even, I mean, didn't even know the context, but just a comment made, negative comment about the vine here. I mean, you would think, man, we're, we're in this thing 12 years. You get used to that. But immediately, I went back to the broken cistern of popularity. I went back to the broken cistern of needing acceptance. I went back to the broken cistern of, need, of caring about what people think. Immediately went back there. Immediately. And I was left thirsty and I was left hungry. Instead of going to the bread of life, instead of going to the living water, we've been drinking from broken cisterns and we're left lacking. Why? Why? If Jesus is all we need, if he's our everything, why do we keep returning to the same well to drink from that we know will leave us thirsty? Why do we keep going back to the same place to eat that we know will leave us hungry? If Jesus is our everything, and he is. He's the bread of life. He's the living water. We lack nothing. He's all we need. The sheep in Psalm 23 don't need to eat the grass, even though it's not about eating. They don't need to drink the water because they have the good shepherd, because they have the bread of life, because they have the living water. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't have that. Like, I don't have that. Maybe you know. You've been drinking from broken cisterns. Maybe you're here and you know you're not a believer. You're not a believer, but you know you've still been drinking from broken cisterns because you know you're never satisfied. You know that you're always left hungry and you're always left thirsty in life. And you know that you've net you, I mean, let's, let's rob another quote from Bono. You have not found what you're looking for. And you know that there's something there because you're here. And you didn't get here by accident. You're here because the Lord's brought you here. You know you've been drinking from those broken cisterns. Would you just cry out to Jesus this morning. Let me tell you what he's done for you. He has taken your place. 
He has lived a life that you could not live, a life that I could not live, a life that no one in this room or in this world has ever lived but him, a life of perfection. And he's died a death, your death, my death, the world's death, a death in the place of us for our sins. He's taken our place. He takes away your sin and gives you his righteousness. He was put in a tomb, but he did not need it but for just a few days because he came forth on the third day, defeating sin and, and darkness and the powers of evil and death. He's been raised up right now. He reigns supreme at the right hand of God the Father. And he says, one day I'm coming back to gather for myself all those who have repented and placed their trust in me. If you're here today and for the first time, that makes sense. For the first time, you're like, I need that living water. I need that bread of life. Would you cry out to him even now? He will feed you the bread of life that leaves you where you'll never be hungry again. He will give you the living water that will mean you will never be thirsty again. Would you cry out to him? And then those of you are here like me. You know the Lord, but man, we've been drinking from the wrong places. We've been eating from the wrong buffets. We've been drinking from broken cisterns. What we need to do, it sounds, oh, get this, what we need to do is repent. Repentance is turning our back on the broken cisterns. And drinking from the living water. That's, it's that easy. It's turning our back on the broken cisterns and drinking from the living water. John Piper says this, The cup of living water never runs dry. The loaf of heaven's bread never is gone. Christ ever gives himself as drink and food for our souls. And it does not run out. I don't care how many times this past week you've run back to the broken cisterns. I don't care how many times. You feel like you could not get your feel and you went back. Jesus has the bread. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. And that's what we need. So, so, so here's the deal. If you're here today and you, you, you don't know him, or you're here today and you do know him, and we've all been drinking from broken cisterns, what we need to do is repent. Turn our backs on those broken cisterns and drink from the living water. Partake of the bread of life, which brings us to the table. In 1 Corinthians, y'all no, may want to come up, but 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 32, this is what the Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the, bo the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who drinks and eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are um, disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Jesus on the night before he took our place. On the night before he was betrayed. I mean hours before he was betrayed. Before he went to a garden and sweated drops of blood for us. Before he was arrested and tried and beaten and mocked and scorned and ultimately hoisted up in the air on an instrument of death in our place. Hours before that, he said, I desire to have a meal with my people. And he instituted this table 
that he still welcomes people to. That he still invites people to. Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now Paul cautions us, examine yourself. Don't partake in an unworthy manner. Paul's not saying, hey, if you're not perfect, don't you come up here. Because there's no one perfect but one at the table of the Lord. This place is full of, un- of imperfect people. Paul's speaking about faith here. He's saying this, this table is open to you if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've placed your faith and trust in Him. If you've repented of your sins, there is a seat for you at the Lord's table. Come and rest because you've been filled. Come and rest because you've had the bread of life. Come and rest because you've drank of the living water. Come and rest. Do you believe that? Then we invite you to the table.